Hypothesis testing is one of the most important concepts in frequency statistics and science. However, most people who test hypotheses are scientists but not statisticians. That's why scientists often do not test hypotheses properly without any bad intentions. So today we'll break down hypothesis testing in small parts and try to properly understand it. Hypothesis testing can be summarized in only five points. You first collect data, then you clearly define null and alternative hypothesis. That's the most important point. Then you get a p-value through something called a statistical test. Every modern software will calculate it for you. You define your rejection threshold, for example, p-value of under 005. And finally, you make a conclusion. For example, if p-value is equal 003, we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative hypothesis. That's actually enough to get you started with hypothesis testing. But if you want to know what exactly null and alternative hypotheses are, why we only reject the null but never accept it, what is p-value and why do we need hypothesis testing at all? Keep watching. So, why do we actually need hypothesis testing? Well, because it helps us to make sense of the data, particularly make a solid claim, create a statement or answer an interesting question. Here is an example of a claim. Sport reduces weight. This claim is our hypothesis. Having several claims creates a compelling story for a thesis or a scientific paper. There is only one problem with that. Why should anyone believe our story? This could be a science fiction story. Thus, in order to make it a real science, not science fiction, we need to make it believable and solid. How? Well, we test every of our hypotheses against the null hypothesis. So, what exactly is the null hypothesis? In order to intuitively understand what the null hypothesis is, just look at the screen for the next three seconds very carefully and see what will happen. What did just happen on the screen? Right, absolutely nothing. Boring, empty, zero, null. And that's exactly what the null hypothesis is. When nothing happens, when there is no effect, when there is no difference, when nothing new was learned. For instance, if our research hypothesis is sport reduces weight, then our null hypothesis is sport does not reduce weight. So we actually need only these two hypotheses to make any of our claims solid. And since our research hypothesis is the only alternative to the null, it is often called the alternative hypothesis. Let's have three examples and clearly define both null and alternative hypothesis. If you measure the effect of sport on muscles, muscle gain is your research or alternative hypothesis, while no muscle gain is your null hypothesis. If you don't believe previous studies or any accepted value, for example that the average weight loss from a fancy diet is 3 kilos per week, you make an experiment in order to test this accepted value. In this case, average weight loss is equal 3 kilograms per week is your null hypothesis, while average weight loss is not equal 3 kilograms per week is your alternative hypothesis. If you study any difference between anything, like groups, treatments, etc., no difference is your null hypothesis, there is a difference is your alternative hypothesis. Expressing such difference between averages of two groups mathematically literally means that the difference is equal to zero. And if we add mean 2 to both sides of the equation, we'll get that. Which again means that if the difference between samples is equal to zero, then the averages of both groups are the same.
For the alternative hypothesis, it would mean that samples or their averages differ. So the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are always mathematical opposites. Which makes the hypothesis testing really simple. And here is the summary of what we have learned so far. In order to answer a question or make a solid claim from our data, we only need two hypotheses, null hypothesis and its only alternative, the alternative hypothesis. Your question, claim or statement is in fact your alternative hypothesis. The best part of the alternative hypothesis is that we can create thousands of them, because we can ask thousands of different questions, or make thousands of different claims. But we always have only one null hypothesis. The beauty of the null hypothesis is that it is always the mathematical opposite of the alternative. Doesn't matter what the alternative is. So the alternative hypothesis is always what the null hypothesis is not. And the best part of the null hypothesis is that we do not need any preliminary data for it. It's always there. For example, no difference or no effect. Ok, we just learned about what hypotheses are, but how do we test them? And what's the point of testing anyway? Well, the only goal of hypothesis testing is to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. There are really only these two possible outcomes. We can never accept the null hypothesis. Why? Let's figure it out on some examples together. Imagine you travel to a completely new country for hiking. You discover a beautiful lake and start to fish. Your alternative hypothesis is that you will catch some fish. But after three hours of fishing, you didn't catch anything, and you even failed to have a single bite. Can you accept the null hypothesis that there is no fish in this lake? Of course not. You only fail to reject it during three hours. Maybe you just need to fish a little longer. So you fish for another hour and finally catch your first fish. In that case, the null hypothesis that there is no fish in that lake is destroyed by the fishy evidence. And further believing the null hypothesis that there is no fish in that lake after you just saw one seems completely ridiculous. Thus, you reject the null in favor of the alternative. That's why we cannot accept the null hypothesis, we can only reject or fail to reject it. And the second example comes from trial courts. If you are accused of a crime, you presume to be not guilty. So the null hypothesis is that you are not guilty. If there is a clear evidence against you, like a videotape, it would be ridiculous to still believe the null hypothesis that you are not guilty. Thus, the judges can reject this null hypothesis that you are not guilty in favor of the alternative hypothesis that you are actually guilty. But if there is not enough evidence against you, for example, no tape or no fingerprints, the judges can't not say that you are guilty. However, in the same time, they also cannot conclude that you are not guilty, because you might have actually committed a crime, but nobody can prove it, because there is absolutely no evidence. So maybe if Sherlock Holmes looked for evidence, he would have found some, but until then, judges cannot accept that you are not guilty, they only can fail to reject it. Everything is clear in the case of fish in the lake. If you found any fish, you simply reject the null hypothesis. But comparing averages of two groups is a bit more complex. Remember our very first hypothesis that sport reduces weight? Let's test that one. Our null hypothesis says sport does not reduce weight, while the alternative hypothesis claims that sport reduces weight. So, we first collect some data from people who did not exercise for one year. 
Some people in this group gained a bit of weight because they eat a lot, while some other people lost a bit of weight because they were sick or on a diet. But despite this mild random variation, on average, the weight change in this group was zero. And that's our null hypothesis. No change in weight. It's often called a control group. Then we'll find another group of people who did exercise for one year and measured their weight before and after that one year of exercise. Imagine we have an average loss in weight of only one kilo. It's not zero change, but it's too close to zero for being taken seriously. It could be just due to the same runner variation we have had in the control group. Then imagine we sampled a different group of people where they lost 3 kilos on average. Here I'm starting to feel uncomfortable to think that the change is close to zero, and I start to think whether I should reject the null hypothesis. Finally, the last group of people who exercised for one year lost 10 kilos on average. Now it's so far away from zero that the null hypothesis that there is no change in weight seems ridiculous. Therefore, we'll reject it in favor of the alternative hypothesis, which claims that sport does actually reduce weight. Interestingly, for the weight loss of 10 kilograms, everyone would agree that sport works. And for the loss of only 1 kilo, people would probably agree that sport does not work. But for 3 kilos, some people would say yes, while some people would say no. And all their opinions would be highly subjective and not truly really concrete. Well, fortunately, hypothesis testing offers a concrete way to decide when we reject and when we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And that is where the p-value comes into play and help us to solve this problem numerically. Oh, sorry, not that p-value, that one. What is p-value? Well, the p-value stands for probability, and it refers to the probability that we would have gotten the results we did just by chance. In the case of looking for the difference in averages between two groups, we can see p-value as a measure of similarity. For example, if two samples are identical, there is 100% similarity and 0% difference, so our p-value is equal to 1. If similarity is only 60%, then the difference is 40%, which is much bigger than zero, but is still small. But interestingly, if the similarity drops to 5% on below, then the difference of 95% is considered significant, and we can confidently reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference between samples in favor of the alternative hypothesis that such difference exists. In other words, if the probability to get the results we have got by chance is below 5%, we can reject the null in favor of the alternative. In order to understand p-value a little better, let's test the very last hypothesis. If you throw a fair coin, you have only two possible outcomes – heads or tails. The chances to get tails are 50% clear and boring result. The chances to get two tails in a row are 25% because we have four possible outcomes. It's actually pretty likely to get two tails in a row. So nothing unusual here, the coin must be fair. However, three tails in a row starts to feel strange. The chances to get three tails in a row are low, only 12%, but still possible. But the chances to get four tails in a row are only 6%. And if we get four tails in a row, we start to doubt whether the coin is actually fair. And if we get six tails in a row despite only 1.5% probability to get them, the null hypothesis that this coin is fair would seem ridiculous and will reject it, because it's simply too unlikely to happen randomly or by chance. A widely accepted but by no means the best cutoff for a p-value is 5%. That means that if your p-value is below 0.05, you can reject the null hypothesis. 
while if your p-value is above 005, you fail to reject denial. So p-values provide concrete boundaries for making a decision about hypothesis testing and are therefore very useful. However, p-values are one of the most misunderstood and misused concepts in statistics. So p-values deserve a separate video. Here, I would like to point out only one, but the most frequent misuse of p-values, which, if eliminated, could dramatically increase the quality of science. Researchers always want to reject the null hypothesis in favor of their research hypothesis, because that would mean that they found something interesting or new. But if the null hypothesis cannot be rejected, it seems like a tragedy or failure. All the efforts of making experiments, collecting and analyzing data seem useless and there is nothing to be published. However, it's not true. We always can say we learned nothing new. The goal of science is not to find an effect or a difference, but to figure out whether there is an effect or difference. And if there is no effect, it is a perfectly valid and equally important result. But some scientists insist on finding something significant and continue looking for it till they found it, a phenomenon known as p-hacking. Well, p-hacking also deserves a separate video. Until then, I'd love to finish with a quote of Kasi Kozerkov. You should get into the habit of learning nothing more often. Because if you insist on learning something beyond the data, every time you test hypothesis, you will learn something stupid. Thank you for watching.